If it weren't for the civil rights movement, Denise wouldn't be the star that she is today. How did dodging bullets lead to her catching award winnings? Let's explore her story and how the pressure of the times birthed a star. From her decades in acting and writing, Denise is estimated to have a net worth of nearly $3 million and owns a secret exclusive multi-million dollar mansion that we'll reveal today. Denise Nicholas appeared in several films during the 1970s and 1980s. She was in the classic blaxploitation film, Blackula, in which she played Michelle Williams. She was also in Let's Do It Again, a comedy film directed by and starring Sidney Poitier, where she played the role of Beth Foster. In the years 1970, 1971, and 1972, Denise was nominated for a Golden Globe for Best TV Actress in a Drama. All three nominations were for her Liz McIntyre character in Room 222. In 1976, she won an NOACP Award for Outstanding Actress in a Motion Picture in Let's Do It Again. Denise was born on July 12, 1944. She was born in Detroit to her parents, Louise and Otto. Her father was a retired bar owner and her mother a housewife. However, they soon divorced and her mother remarried Robert Bergen, so they moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan. Denise didn't really dream of being in the entertainment industry until she was much older. In fact, when she was 16, she appeared in Jet Magazine as one of the students whose dream was to become a teacher. She graduated in 1961 and headed off to university. She attended the University of Michigan and having abandoned her dream to become a teacher, was now on track to be a law student. Later in her first year, she switched majors to instead study Latin American politics, Spanish, and English. She was struggling to find herself during university and couldn't settle on what she wanted. Over time, this started to affect her academic career. The strain of the academic debt of university didn't help either. She decided to drop out after completing her second year at university. Instead of getting a degree, she decided that it would be better for her to go the trade way and get a job. She packed her things and moved to New York City, which she knew was buzzing with opportunities for anyone looking for work. There, she ended up at J. Walter Thompson Advertising Firm and started out as an intern. Meanwhile, she resumed her academics by transferring to Tulane University. During the late 60s and 70s, the civil rights movement in America was getting more organized. The late 60s saw the emergence of the Black Power movement, and their news coverage gave them significantly more public awareness. African American people all over the country were demonstrating and protesting for equal employment and opportunity. Denise caught wind of the situation and decided to take part after hearing speakers on campus encouraging black students to join the movement. The same year she enrolled in Tulane, she dropped out to join the Free Southern Theater, leaving her job and life behind. Her mother was frustrated with her decision. She believed it was incredibly risky and ultimately futile. The FST was a prime target of the Ku Klux Klan in the South because of their radical political shows that criticized racism in America. When the group had to sleep at the homes of allies during their tour, they would sleep on the floor because when their location was known, the Klan would shoot into their houses. She toured the South with them, putting on shows where they could, and between these activist art demonstrations, Denise developed an interest and appreciation for acting as an art form. After the tour ended, she decided to join the Negro Ensemble Company. There, she did the entire first season of the theater ensemble. Having found her passion in acting, she auditioned for and was cast as Liz McIntyre in the ABC series Room 222. Following the success of Room 222, Nicholas secured a leading role in the popular TV series In the Heat of the Night, based on the 1967 film and the John Ball novel. She played Harriet DeLong, a city councilwoman who frequently found herself at odds with the local police. To dive deeper into the true stories of the legends of Black Hollywood, 
click the subscribe button and the notification bell. Denise's career was doing well, but in 1980, tragedy struck. Denise was born the middle child of three. She has an older brother named Otto and a younger sister named Michelle. As Denise's career was progressing, her sister was doing pretty well too. After completing university, she moved to Chicago and became an editor at Ebony Magazine and had been working there for at least two years. She was one of the youngest and most talented editors they had on the team. Michelle wasn't known to have any enemies or associates with anyone who could have potentially harmed her. She was actually pretty popular for being a fairly reserved person. In February of 1980, Michelle took a flight from Chicago to New York City to have a meeting with a newspaper editor before she would visit the family in L.A. However, she missed her flight to L.A. after planning to see her sister, and Denise began to worry. Two days later, the police called Denise to inform her that Michelle's body was found in a locked rental car at the airport. She had never left New York, she was shot to death, and her body was placed in the car. Denise was shattered by this incident, and for months she traveled across the country with her brother, trying to get the police to do more to find her sister's murderer. The police claimed there wasn't any evidence they could use and dropped the case. There were no clues that Denise could find. No clues of someone who wanted to bring her harm or even that her sister was robbed. Her purse was missing, but all of the expensive jewelry she was wearing remained untouched. Denise fell into a depression. She was filled with too much anguish to go on working and found normal everyday tasks insurmountable. To make matters worse, she didn't know why it happened and she had no one to blame. This irrational feeling ate her alive for years. She found it difficult to work in this state, but she pushed on to support herself financially. During this time, she only made four television appearances on shows like The Love Boat and Different Strokes, but she didn't take on any film roles that year. She decided to take her acting passion even further by getting a degree in drama, and she received her Bachelor of Arts in Drama at the University of South Carolina in 1987. She graduated on the Dean's List and intended to continue to do her Masters. During this time, she was very one-track minded. All she wanted was to achieve a certain goal in each of her endeavors, and it brought her a lot of relief to have something to focus on. In 1989, she was nominated for an NAACP award for Outstanding Lead Actress in Mother's Day. In the following years, with therapy and family and focusing on her work that made her happy, she was able to recover from the pain of the death of her sister. She continued to consistently take roles until her last TV role in 2002 and her last film role in 2004, although she did return in 2015 to do a small role in Mr. Fantastic. Instead, she focused on other aspects of her career. Denise had been an avid supporter of many charity causes, including Color of Change, Beyond Basics, and the Southern Poverty Law Center. Color of Change is a powerful civil rights advocacy organization focused on strengthening the political voice of African Americans. It campaigns against injustice and promotes solutions to critical issues affecting black communities including police violence, mass incarceration, and economic inequality. They do most of their work through digital activism. Beyond Basics is an educational nonprofit based in Detroit that works to eradicate illiteracy among school-aged children. They provide intensive, one-on-one -on -one literacy tutoring and programs to help students reach their full potential. The Southern Poverty Law Center is a renowned legal advocacy organization dedicated to fighting hate and bigotry while seeking justice for the most vulnerable members of society. Founded in 1971, the SPLC monitors hate groups and other extremists throughout the United States and exposes their activities to the public and law enforcement. Additionally, the SPLC works in courts and communities to protect civil rights and dismantle systemic racism and discrimination. She wrote the song, Can We Pretend, which was recorded by her then-husband, 
Bill Withers on his 1974 album, Adjustments. Later, Nicholas became widely recognized for her role as Harriet DeLong on CBS's In the Heat of the Night. In addition to acting, she wrote six episodes of the series, marking the beginning of her second career as a writer. Following the show's cancellation, Nicholas enrolled in the professional writing program at the University of Southern California. She continued bettering her writing skills at the Journeyman's Writing Workshop under the guidance of author Janet Fitch, with whom she worked for five years. Nicholas also participated in the Squaw Valley Community of Writers Workshop and the Natalie Goldberg Workshop in Taos, New Mexico. Nicholas wrote a novel named Freshwater Road. It was published by Agate Publishing in August 2005. She got most of her inspiration for it from her younger days in the civil rights movement. For years, she kept the idea to herself, saving notes for it around her house. Denise Nicholas conveyed that her experiences from the civil rights movement were carried throughout her career as an actress in New York and Hollywood. Her work in television and film was always anchored and balanced by her involvement in the civil rights movement. She knew, even when the South was left behind, that a book inspired by that period would eventually be written. Many years later, after studying creative writing, she wrote Freshwater Road. During the writing process, long buried memories from her time in Mississippi and Louisiana were brought back, as if they had been waiting to be invited back into her consciousness. She described it as a coming of age story about a young woman who goes to Mississippi in 1964. According to Denise, it is her literary version of an oral history, made as factual and truthful as possible, and as vividly imagined as the weight of those times would allow. The novel received critical acclaim, earning a starred review in Publishers Weekly and being named one of the best books of 2005 by The Washington Post, The Detroit Free Press, The Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Newsday, and The Chicago Tribune. In 2006, Freshwater Road won the Zora Neale Hurston Award for Debut Fiction and the American Library Association's Black Caucus Award for Debut Fiction. The novel was later reprinted by Pocket Books. Brown University commissioned Nicholas to create a staged adaptation of Freshwater Road, which was presented on May 2, 2008. Denise's career has served as an inspiration to many women of color trying to break into Hollywood. She's especially an inspiration to the youth to fight for what they believe in and stand in protest for justice. In 2018, she told Detroit PBS that she was always proud and excited to see the continued practice of protest through art and demonstration among American youths. Denise has never revealed where she's lived before, but we have a secret exclusive on her current abode. Let's take a look. Denise lives in Ann Arbor in West Detroit. She owns one of the few multi-million dollar modern homes in her neighborhood. Leading up the tar road in the middle of nowhere is the bricked driveway to the home of the legendary Denise Nicholas. At first sight, you'll be met by the encroaching size of the typical gray-washed modern mansion. Then you'll notice the home's expansive acres of perfectly trimmed grass, surrounded by a ring of pine trees for privacy. The home has six bedrooms and seven bathrooms and spans over nearly 10,000 square feet. In the hills of Walter Way, her mansion sits squarely between acres and acres of nature, far from any other residence. The house was built in 2012 and she bought it soon after. It's designed with modern sensibilities in mind, with lots of grays and stone detail. Her dark stained swings open to reveal a modestly decorated white interior home. However, the home is only modest by luxury standards, as the living room has been equipped with a built-in fireplace, and surrounding it is more white decor to fit the feel of her home. This theme continues throughout the house, which is mainly painted white with black, gold, and silver decor, and sometimes random splashes of blue. The house has an art room in which she's kept statues and wall decor ornaments. The dining room is plastered in gold and white wallpaper, and a small window reveals the view of her home. 
overlooking a small forest of pine trees planted on the edge of her land. Besides that, her home has a second living room decorated in a similar fashion, multiple studies, a laundry room, a bar, and a cinema and gaming room. Hidden in her basement is a showroom just for wine with an expansive collection, perfect for huddling up with guests to open a new bottle and socialize. Her home may not have the traditional pool, but it does have a hot tub and sauna hidden in the corner of the backyard. The home also features a built-in outdoor kitchen for cookouts on hot summer days. Ann Arbor offers a diverse mix of residential options, academic influence from the nearby University of Michigan, and a rich cultural scene. From single-family homes to modern apartments, the area accommodates a varied community. Being close to the university brings an intellectual vibe, attracting faculty, staff, and students. Since Denise is interested in the academic aspects of her career, it was the perfect place for her. Nearby green spaces like Bird Hills Nature Area provide recreational opportunities. Even though people live far apart, there are often community events in the neighborhood that bring them all together. To a historical Hollywood celebrity like her, living in a private area where people can't see her business is essential. In the sparsely placed homes of this neighborhood, she doesn't have to worry about privacy or safety. She lives in the safety and luxury that she deserves. A home that luxurious has to come with cars that fit the theme. Denise has put together a surprisingly fitting car collection that seamlessly complements the laid-back sophistication of her home. Her car collection includes a black Mercedes C-Class for going about her daily errands. Because her house is so far off from the rest of town, she had to make a choice that would provide comfort and speed with a touch of class and modernity. This prestigious car isn't just a mode of transportation. It is an extension of her personality, effortlessly blending sophistication with practicality. For her more humble journeys, she got her hands on a silver Lexus. A brand name means less to her than what the care can actually give her. And out of a Lexus, she wanted an easy-going way to get to her destination. It gets her around just as good, if not sometimes better than her Mercedes does for a fraction of the price. For a reliable and affordable option, Denise made a great choice. Lastly, the most inconspicuous vehicle in her collection is a 2015 sedan. Perfect for getting about without drawing too much attention to herself. Denise may love to live comfortably and in luxury, but there's certainly no need for her to draw attention to herself when she's just out and about trying to live like everyone else. Her car collection shows just how much more important it is to her to have something she would actually use instead of something too extravagant. Her collection and home are just as modest as her personality. When she dropped out of college to join the theater, she met a man named Gilbert Moses. Gilbert was actually the head of the FST and a director. He was studying in Paris before he also left college to join the movement. Over time, Denise became attracted to his strong moral values and how he stood for what he believed in. In May of 1964, they got married at the American Theater in New York. He was always directing films about the African-American experience, heritage, and history. However, their relationship didn't work out, and in 1967, after just three years of marriage, Denise filed for divorce. In 1969, his off-Broadway show Slave Ship won him an Obie Award for Best Director. He won a Tony Award in 1971 for being the most promising director of the year. In January of 1973, she married singer-songwriter Bill Withers. Their relationship was on the rocks from the start, and they were often on and off. The year before Denise was shooting a film in Arizona, and Bill took a flight out just to see her in her motel room. She called the police soon after to report that he assaulted her after she threatened to break up with him. However, she didn't press charges after the incident and proceeded with the marriage. A year later, she filed for divorce. Three months after her sister's tragic death, Denise met Jim Hill at a Sacramento poetry reading. She was still struggling with grief, 
although she was making her way out of her depression. Jim was a former cornerback and news sports anchor for CBS. They got married on Valentine's Day in 1981. However, they separated eight months later and Denise filed for divorce. Within a month, they reconciled their marriage and stayed married for another year. In 1984, Denise filed for divorce again, and it was finalized in 1987. Click on this next video and discover the shocking life stories of your favorite Black Hollywood icons. Which inspiring individual would you like to learn more about? Comment your choice.